Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Hot Pot Talks. I am Jen Sunshine here with my dear friend and longtime creative partner, David Ng, and we are coming to you live from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. You might know us as the co-founders and co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces documentary film about QT BIPOCs. We're also members of the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative, also known as Value Co-op. Hapa Talks is a weekly series live streaming to YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we have free flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, and community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities, what ethical responsibilities do we have as artists, what community organizing and art making looks like during quarantine, all the while sharing our favorite hot pot ingredients. So why Hot Pot Talks? Um, as Jen mentioned, Value Co-op is, uh, we're a part of Value Co-op, and Value Co-op has a studio in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Association building in Chinatown. And when we knew that we were going to move into Chinatown, we had really long conversations about what we could do as artists to be proactive um, and generative about building reciprocal relationships in the community, especially recognizing how the role of artists and how artists, the role of the role that artists have played in, in gentrification in Chinatowns all over all over the world. And we really wanted to be deliberate about what we were doing that was supporting uh, the community that we were going to be going into. Um, and so Thinking about that, one of the things that we have been uh, developing with our with the landlords, the Limb Association, um, and the elders on the board who I've known for almost twenty years, is a project called Engaging Engaging Chinatown, um, where we're going to be digitizing their archives and turning them into a visual art exhibit. And so this Hot Pot Talks is a part of this larger project of trying to bridge uh, cultural barriers around the history of Chinatown, um, yeah, and to invite people to connect with um, the community here. Um, and of course, this is of particular significance because of our, our guests today and the AYA Collective who, who are doing amazing work in uh, Edmonton's Chinatown um, as well. Um, yeah, and just on the idea of Hot Pot Talks, um, this idea, the, the idea of Hot Pot Talks uh, came from using the metaphor of the hot pot uh, to connect with community warmth and nourishment, thinking about Chinatowns as nourishment, thinking about the ceremony of, of hot pot, so sharing food, the communal nature, uh, and the many different types of hot pot too. So it, the different varieties all over Asia, even like fondue as a form of hot pot, thinking about the different types of food, the variety, the different textures as a metaphor for thinking about community dialogue. Um, yeah, and so on those themes, we're really excited. We've we've mentioned this a few for a few times now, um, but we have these limited edition totes that we have uh, that we had designed um, hot by off the press. Off the press. <laughs> I literally ran to the studio to pick these up right before today, so they're available. I think um, our colleagues are dropping the link of how to buy them um, in the chat right now. Um, Jen, do you want to tell us about these? Yeah. As, so as I model. <laughs> <laughs> That's your favorite thing. Have you eaten today? Simply means. I love you in BIPOC language. A simple question asked by so many of our parents, elders, and aunties everywhere evokes a shared familial understanding of love and tenderness. These feelings of unspoken care inspire Hapa Talks where culture and community nourish our bodies and for our hearts too. Have you eaten today? <laughs> Um, so before we introduce our esteemed guests, um, we want to do a quick acknowledgement of our practicum students who are working tirelessly in the back end, um, helping out. And so we want to thank Lamia, Cameron, Ava, Jessica, and Victoria. Uh, okay, so I am so, so, so excited to introduce Edmonton's Aya Collective, who are a group of artists and Chinatown community members creating dialogue and understanding about the cultural erasure, displacement, and gentrification of Edmonton's Chinatown. We come together to dream new futures. Welcome to the hot pot table, Lan, Wailing, Sean, and Grace. Welcome. Hey. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting. Yeah. yeah. So nice to have you guys join us. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we'll start off with um, um, a question for all of you. 
Uh, since you're based in Edmonton, and I kind of mentioned, you know, some of the work that you guys were up to, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about um, Aya Collective. And I'm actually curious how you guys met too. So yeah, if you could tell me what is Aya Collective and how you guys met. Uh, this is the star when we get to see who <laughs> introduce us. Um, well, Aya started because of the removal of Edmonton's Chinatown Gate, the Harbin Gate in 2017. And the, our community was really sad and angry. And so we just wanted to make a public space where we could just remember this important um, landmark. Um, so it's... All, it's all because of the removal of the Harbin Gate is why we formed. Mm, very cool. Can you maybe tell me, I'm curious about if others have stories about that, um, that organizing that you guys did. Um, what was that like? Actually, can I? Um, yeah. It was, um, it was something that was done by the uh, Chinese community. So um, there was a, a uh, vigil that happened on the night of the removal of the the gate um and so uh, there were um the, there was a call out to the chinese community uh the organizations to come to where the gate was located and um that was the beginning we all were giving shirts to uh to wear that it's almost like um, a protest against the removal of the gate. And people were uh, speaking that night as well too. It was cold night, it was in uh, in winter and it was one of the coldest night, uh, winter nights and, and everybody was all bundled up. But uh, it was also an emotional time too, to see the gate being, um, that we're losing the gate. Uh, and we were trying to document as um, much as possible. So what we had was one of the um, one of the uh, or a business that we um, are connected with, and he's very active in the community. Uh, he actually brought his cherry picker and trying to film the removal of the gate as much as, and document that as much as possible. But anyway, uh, people were speaking and uh, about the, um, their remembrance of the gate, and and, and so it was quite. Um, and we're trying to get city's council to make a statement that they will replace the gate for us. Um, of mm -hmm. course, uh, the city councilors didn't make that uh, public statement. Um, in, we were hoping that they would. Uh, that evening. So that's how it started. But at the same time, we were already uh, looking at, you know, through grace, really, uh, how we can um, do more than just an, an evening together uh, in a vigil, trying to um, rally up people to be there. So that's, uh, that's the significant uh, night Mm. Um, for the for that, I I remember um, Grace uh, was introduced to me through another mutual friend, uh, Yong Fei <laughs> Guan, and uh, I remember Grace was really upset about the removal of the gate uh, because it has a quite um, important uh, experience uh, to her life about uh, when. She has relatives visiting Edmonton. Her mom would bring the relatives to the gate, mm -hmm. and then they have pictures taken. It's something we are so proud of that Chinese people have been in Edmonton, and then we have this beautiful gate. You know, and it's a, it's a, a result of many people work together. And I remember mm -hmm. somebody share how they fundraise uh, a million dollars. You know, in the Chinese community. Um, you know, in addition to whatever the city of Edmonton contributed and the city of Harbin contributed. Um, but it was such a big thing um, among many uh, senior citizens now, but then they were younger, they were maybe in the 60s because it was in the 80s. So many of them, they have this like, proud memory. Say, finally, we have a symbol representing Chinese in Edmonton. 
Yes. So to see that being there for some time and then being removed, mm-hmm. and at that point we didn't know what would happen. You know, what's the future and what is our icon? What's our symbol? The Chinese、um, community in Edmonton,、yeah. right? When you can see that the first、uh, Chinese arriving、uh, Edmonton in was it May 1895? Sean, you may remember or Ben may remember something like that. 1890, I think. 1890. Yeah, 1890. Yeah, his name、uh, in in English is John Key K E E, but in Chinese is Ji Zhong Hao, Zhu Zhong Xiao, and and he came with his brother from Calgary、um, to establish a laundry service、uh, in Edmonton, where the Canada Place is located. I think in that neighborhood. So that was the first Chinese that came that long ago. Mm-hmm. And like since then, the community built and built, right?、Mm-hmm. And have this icon、um, gate being removed, and with such a big hole, big gap, question mark. So a lot of us felt really, really sad about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sean, do you have anything to add? Ah,、uh, I think. Uh, well, I'm I'm not、um, originally from Edmonton. I'm from Toronto. And so I arrived here in 2016, and、um, I, I basically I, I think a, a huge part of wanting to、uh, be around more Chinese Canadians and and get to know my Chinatown was really、um, because you know I, I think Edmonton obviously like it has like.、Uh, You know, it's predominantly white, and so、mm-hmm. most of like my friends and stuff like that. I knew that you know there's a Chinatown community here, and so I think my interest to connect with folks in Aya and and other people in in the community were really just you know wanting to share share some of the sim- similar interests, cultural interests, and so yeah, I think it all kind of happened.、Um, I mean, the the gate came down in 2017, and so yeah, it's right around the time where I'm really kind of like looking for my community and looking to connect.、And、so I think that was a big part of what、um, drew me into wanting to, you know, make friends with everyone and 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 hear everyone out. There's um, it's、uh, you know, like hearing. Wai Ling, you had said something in particular, and Sean. I'm just thinking about this particular line that really resonates with both David and and I,、um, which is,、uh, "We come together to dream new futures."、Um, and of course, we can't have a future if we don't understand our past and have those like symbols that represent our past,、um, which are so significant in in. Not just our culture, but like in who we are and who we will become, and who our future generations will will become.、Um, yeah. Now I understand why Ling, you're a new grandmother,、um, and Sean, you're a new.、Um, remind me again, you're a uncle. new uncle. Yes,、um, <laughs> so that is so exciting.、Um, you know, I think that family obviously is such a. I, I I have very complex relationships with family, or the word family, and what family means.、Um, but I also I don't know where what I'm trying to say here. But I just I really appreciate like the the matriarchs in 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 Chinese culture and the ways in which、um, mothers and grandmothers hold a very special place、um, in in Chinese culture. I don't know. Uh, yeah, help me out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Like, one of my questions was because it's really I, I find it really awesome, like the intergenerational or、yes. like work that you guys are doing. That's what I was <laughs> together. Yeah, and I was thinking so.、Um, so I, pe- people might notice I have a new different setup today, and usually it's much more distant. I wanted to、um, showcase.、Um, there's a piece of art behind me by Paul Wong. Where am I pointing there? <laughs>、um, it's from his series、um, Mother's Cupboard. Um, and it, it it has all of these.、Um, he he photographed all of his mother's、uh, herbs that had these red lids. It's very very、um, uh, common in in like my my parents have the exact same cupboard with the red lids and and the herbs. And、um, 
the, the, his, the, the, these pieces are featured at the Museum of Vancouver right now. I just saw it on the weekend. This amazing exhibit called "A Seat at the Table," um, where they where they're um, they're they're showcasing um, the sort of the 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 stories of Chinese immigration in 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 Canada. Now I forgot where I was going with this. Oh yes, Paul Wong. And one of the things, so so Jen's mentioning, you know, um, she mentioned this uh, this 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 theme of dreaming about new futures. And um, when we had a, we had an exhibit last year um, at the Sum Gallery called Yellow Peril: The Celestial Elements. And one of the things we were thinking about was like the fact that a, a lot of times as people of color, like our culture is seen as something in the past, you know, something over there that we, that doesn't evolve, right? And of course that's not true. You know, we, it, culture is constantly being generated um, and it's, it, it evolves as we engage with it. Um, so I guess, yeah, I was, and, and Paul, and I'm, I was also thinking about what Paul said to us at one point when we were putting together the exhibit that, you know, for him, his, his parents were the generation that quote unquote left Chinatown. Like say it was the same as my family too. Like I, my parents were the ones who were like, oh, well we live in this area now and there's Chinese grocery stores. So we don't need to go to Chinatown anymore. And then it was our, my generation. And you know, even though Paul's in an older generation than me but he was the one, like we had a commonality in the sense that we want, we were the ones that wanted to return and reclaim mm -hmm. that, 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 that story or that narrative about um, our heritage. To this space too, so that's a very long-winded way of me asking how is how is that um, how has that been for you guys? How has that been um, working together intergenerationally? Um, yeah. Do you have fights? Do you fight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> or maybe Wiling doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of this group. They, I really appreciate um, being part of Aya. Um, Lang is um, a connector in the Chinese community. Lang has mm. so much knowledge. To work alongside with her is truly an honor. And then when I read that Grace and Sean, seeing the passion they have for, for China, China I, I, I didn't know how how I felt about Chinatown, but I always feel recharged when I go to Chinatown. Mm. I've been in Edmonton for over 35 years. Wow. And every so often I took my family there and that's my recharge of my identity. Mm. I told my girls, I don't know why I was so happy on the weekends when I came back from Chinatown. I could not explain it. And then as time moved on, I realized that I feel so be part of the community, you know, and I see things familiar to me and I see familiar faces and people seem to have similar feeling that they feel they, they belong to Chinatown. They find something that they love, something they knew, something they're familiar with that I would say, I don't get the feeling when I go to Safeway. <laughs> 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 if I'm all the groceries, I'm ready to cook. I'm going to make soup. I'm going to make this. I'm going to make this. Right? Mm. I'm sure my, my daughters and my husband felt that like energy level just like elevated. You know, mm -hmm. I came back from China again. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember one time Wai Ling brought me to a Chinese herbal shop in in Chinatown and. That was kind of my dreams because I used to be so intimidated to go in because I didn't speak the language. But Wiling as a guide, as an auntie, like showed me how to make Qingbo Wen Tong. And then we got to share that with the Aya community. And that was really special. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, we actually have a, um, a get together in my daughter's apartment. And then we got different uh, ingredients from, uh, for the Qingbo uh, Wen kind of share like what is this is good for and why this is combination and everybody they like, you know have a, a collection of the chamber learning ingredients to take home and it was so much fun right sharing the knowledge um the grace remember her mom made that soup not to her when she was younger mm -hmm. and I'm sure sean you know remember that to in his household and then probably made it for her family as well <laughs> We just feel so 
wonderfully connected, you know, the in interactivity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just beautiful to have um, members of different age. Yeah, and I want to go back to how, how nice to work with Grace and Sean. And they're professional, they're respectful, and they always want to learn. Mm -hmm. and Lang and me, I think I can speak for Lang, we always like to share. We always like to um, share what we know to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you have this eager, younger generation, and they have this attitude, tell me more. And you, I just feel so, yes, this is my moment. I want to teach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear this. Um, I hear this a lot, especially from, I'm an only child, um, but I hear from my parents. Um, I'm originally from Taiwan. I was born there. And um, my parents are often telling me, you know, that their, their friends' kids just like are uninterested in learning about, you know, the culture or even just learning about their history and, and, and familial stories. Um, and so there is a sense of that like loss, like that I hear from my parents and, and, and my parents eight people uh, and their peers and their friends. Um, and so it, 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 yeah, I, I, I just wonder about, um, that sense of loss and, and disconnect from like older generations with the younger generations um, and how and what we do about that. I guess we started the AYA Collective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of, I've shared this story before, but one of the things I've been doing during COVID, part of my arts practice, but um, you know, maybe I don't, not, not even just overthinking it. It's just a way that I'm showing, sharing things with my aunties. Um, my aunties, uh, my dad's sisters are sort of the holders of the, the soup making um, knowledge in my family. Um, like my, one of my aunts would literally bring a soup to us like every week, sometimes twice a week, depending on what ailments or changes in the weather, right? And, but one of the things, cause I, during COVID that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to distance myself from them because they're older and I, didn't, I don't want to sort of pose any risks or whatever, but I started, um, finding these recipes and just doing my own research and finding the recipes on my own and delivering it to them. And they, they were just like, it's just week after we went not and I don't deliver it every week, but when I do deliver it, they'll call me like the next day and be like, how did you learn how to make this? You know, cause it was something that it's not like necessarily a guarded secret, but it's something the women in my family Mm -hmm. carried right and it wasn't something they, they taught my sister some of the soups but it's not something they would necessarily teach me to um and so they so they've been really sort of um i think um endeared that i would actually go through the the, the effort of you know going to the internet and comparing recipes and and trying to figure out how to how to how to do those soups <laughs> mm -hmm. david i like to pretend that i'm one of your aunties and I, I think if I would have David deliver soup to me, <laughs> I would be so thrilled that, oh. you know, that David is learning the essence, the culture that oh. for like hundreds and thousands of years. I, yeah. I would be so proud of you, David. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, and uh, Grace, I also just want to mention, I share with you the, the, the anxiety about going to uh, the mm -hmm. herbal store because there's also like, um, you know, it's it's, I, it's I'm Chinese, but there's also a culture of shopping in those rest in those spaces that I'm just not used to. And I, because I live, I basically live a block from Chinatown. I, I've been forcing myself to to go to the grocery stores and also to the herbal stores. I've, I'm now comfortable in one of the stores. I hope they never close because now they know me and they're like, I always just like Google the translation and show them on my yeah. phone. Oh, <laughs> and they're that. totally comfortable with that interaction. So. Right. Oh, that's inspiring. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very really good way to use technology. Yes. <laughs> I I totally get it too. I, I just uh, I tried to order dim sum over over the phone on, on the weekend and I was like totally like just brushed aside. I think I mean I think the I was trying to use my Cantonese and, and they were just like just speak in English. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> I, I, like I think I think they were super busy and smashed, so like I wasn't I wasn't like any any of them, but I'm like if I'm yeah. like a new Cantonese learner and like somebody yeah. just like just quit it, just like you just I can I understand English, just go for the English. Yeah. Um, it can be very demoralizing, right? And so, um, 
Yeah, I think I think I think one of the biggest kind of takeaways that I get also from thinking about working intergenerationally and also thinking about just working with folks that have stories that share my culture is mm-hmm. is that you don't realize that everybody has very different experiences to that culture mm-hmm. like we might share like this experience of a soup but then you find out when you're in these circles that aren't your family or the people that you're generally have sharing these soups with you're like oh my goodness they do it in a in in a totally different way than i thought and you kind of have these like fixed assumptions as a chinese canadian thinking yeah oh yeah this is chinese culture like you think that your family and what they've done is like what everyone else does and so there is kind of and, and and maybe it's a canadian thing too like that there's like this illusion of a like a monolith mm-hmm. culture but then that's exactly why we got to like come together because we're like no it's not so it's not <laughs> like more like what my parents told me as like like potentially like a completely like like a myth could be yeah. like another story told to totally. another, yeah, another person. And so yeah. I think I think um, one of the things that I'm also like, like really drawn to like doing this kind of connecting work is that I actually, I'm like, I'm really concerned about losing all the stories and losing, losing, you know, everything that my parents taught me, like, you know, once they're gone, like, I, there's only so much that I can actually like hold on to or like pass on to somebody else. And I think mm-hmm. growing up, you think it's going to be here forever. It's my culture. No, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be forever and people are going to just like pass it on and stuff like that. And it's very naive to think that I think for myself. And so I think part of our work is really trying to reclaim some of that and making sure that, you know, it doesn't just get erased. That's fascinating. Do you find difficulty or any like challenges around asking questions? Because I I have so many questions, but I don't even know. I am, and maybe I'm shy. I don't even know how to broach the topic with my own family, with my own parents, you know. And especially because my Mandarin is like stuck at a grade two level, um, and so I I can't go to the depth of 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 like dialogue that I would like mm-hmm. with with my parents, you know, yeah, um, because yeah. of that language, the loss of language. Yeah. I Great. feel this. I feel the same way. I've been asking stories about my family history for years, and um, I think there's some darkness and sadness in the past. So people are wondering or maybe suspicious of me asking questions and mm. it's not until my sister is pregnant and when she's when she's asking questions now they understand and they get it and so it's such a beautiful time to hear stories right now but mm. yeah how do how do I ask questions in a way that in my culture people will understand and mm-hmm. will be willing to share because not everyone's like wiling and lan <laughs> but, um, that's interesting because um, I'm just thinking of my parents' generation. Are you guys talking about learning how to cook and, and things like that? Mm-hmm. I remember uh, actually my my parents, my mom especially, when I try to follow her and learn how to do, you know, like the the Chinese zhong and, mm-hmm. and try to make it. And she would say to me, you're so clumsy, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then she said, like, just go away, I'll do it. And mm-hmm. I said, well, how can I learn? And how can you, you know, and because I find those would be opportunity for me to connect with her and get to know her and, and then ask questions. But she kept shooing me out of the kitchen and <laughs> too clumsy. You don't, you know, uh, just go and read a book or go, go do something and uh, just don't mess up my kitchen mm-hmm. uh, be- because of then anyway um, I had to actually go like David I had to go and do textbook learning how to cook mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so even in my generation with my uh, parents generation I'm 
there are challenges in yeah. trying to preserve mm -hmm. the culture and yeah. how do you connect with your parents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I so the, the gems are- experience uh, with making jong with my mom as well. Uh, she visited from Hong Kong and then I, I asked her to show me how to make it. Mm -hmm. And then we got all the ingredients and um, similar to, to Len's experience, my mom, mom didn't show me out of the kitchen, but she practically did everything. <laughs> you know, I was just watching her, you know, and, and she was so fast. Oh, it's just like amazing. You, you think this lady, you know, with arthritis, you know, in both yeah. hands, and, and then they, she just said, there, before you know it, they're done. Right? And then you got this <laughs> delicious Jong sitting there for you. It just feels feel so ashamed. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> Grace, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just want to say, like, why I like was so generous about us but i have to say like with these stories the gems are wilding and wild if like we're sharing stories about how difficult it is to learn from maybe our um our like the elders from our family and wilding and wild just been so incredibly generous and so yeah yeah and i and and jen i i, I have like like i totally echo what you're saying about like like the connection part even because it's it's very personal like fa with family yeah and so i feel like with aya we're able to talk to each other like we would be asking what we've always wanted to ask our family but it's just it seems like it might be a, even a safer space mm -hmm. you know like like there is like i mean because we come together with like knowing that we're asking because we want to learn like these things that maybe our parent, like maybe like I, I, I could totally see that as well. It's like if I went into the kitchen to like cook with my dad who does a lot of cooking, um, he might just be like, you're just slowing me down. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, are you here to help me or just slow me down? Like, aren't we just supposed to be <laughs> You know what I mean? So I kind yeah. of hear that like, that kind of sentiment there, but it's like, how do you how do you go about priming your parents or, or mm -hmm. and maybe using Aya as a way to be like, how do we talk to our family about I want to learn these recipes instead yeah. of just like, you know? So I think I think I think this is actually something I super value with Aya is that we 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 allow it to be that space where we're kind of testing the mm -hmm. testing the grounds for things that. I think we secretly want to probably ask all our family members. <laughs> yeah. Now, can Aya Collective produce like a 10 step guide of like a <laughs> templated conversational guide and question and then distribute it everywhere so we can use it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a so good. I, that's good because uh, just following up with uh, Sean's comment, it's, uh, it's almost like uh, talking to Grace and Sean and asking question is it's the other way around where you know it's almost as like asking my children and i treat them like my children um my son you know questions that i want to ask my son but i probably would say oh mom you know uh get real uh, <laughs> and, and and it won't answer my questions so I feel that, and uh, like Sean says, it's a safe space. So I could ask those questions of Grace and Sean, and I'm sure that they won't brush me aside and say, get real, mom. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so anyway, that could be the other way around too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I want you to go back to a question that, sorry, Jen mentioned about uh, your parents have friends feeling that they're kind of disconnected with the children. Yeah. I actually see that a lot. Mm. Um, yeah, my friends too. They, you know, you, you feel that they almost feel like I can't talk to my children. I can't share my knowledge with them. Um, I think because some people may think it's old fashioned, you know, Chinese mm -hmm. soup. What, what are those things so mysterious? We don't eat things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a little bit of that. So when I see my daughter, uh, she's 35 now, yesterday, um, and she's a asking questions. And, and, and I have the opportunity to share with her. And I'm one of the lucky ones that my children want to, you know, to learn and they want to learn continuously. They always have new questions. 
and now with my new grandson, so I can see that you know this kind of question and answer will continue. I, mm -hmm. I count myself like lucky that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I share um so much of what you guys have said resonates with my story too. Um, a quick story. I, I, a couple of years ago, um, so on my on one side of my family, we have a very large. Um, my grandmother's from Indonesia, and there's a very very large family there. But when she passed, when my grandma passed, um, that we really lost touch. And I, I've been always been really curious about that family there because it's quite a large family, right? And I think it was we had I, we had a similar encounter, you know, when I brought this up. Um, and I think part of it is because you know there's there's trauma there as well you know especially when you come from histories of refugee displacement and then occupation sometimes you know like there's there's a lot of trauma so i think there's a bit of no one's ever said this to me but i think the underlying tone is like like we left for a reason <laughs> why do why are you bringing this back up to the surface mm -hmm. Um, and so they've been, but it, it, they've also been, it's been a nice sort of, you know, my, my parents have been like, you know, it's really, they, they really love the fact that I'm really interested in my family history. And so I, I, I asked my, the, cause I know we have the addresses or the last addresses of um, that family um, from Indonesia from decades ago. Um, and I took a photo on my phone and I had um, a, a, a friend of mine, Dora Ng, I don't know, Dora, you might be watching. Thank you again for doing the translations. <laughs> but I, I translated it into English and, and Chinese um, and I added like my social media as well. And a bunch of them wrote back to me. So it's been this, if it wasn't for COVID, I would have actually gone to um, uh, Maidan last year to visit them in, in, in Indonesia. Um, but yeah, just thinking about those, those different um, connections and experiences. Um, I have a, I had a question because this is this came up in some of our other talks. Um, in in a, the, our first couple of talks, talks we asked people their experiences with hot pot actually because Sean going back to what you were saying when Jen and I were talking about it I think it was like right before the first episode we realized that we had totally different experiences with, with hot pot. I yeah. never had I never had hot pot growing up. <laughs> so I'm curious what was what has what's your guys's experience with um, hot pot. Well, I, I just to jump in here, um, the in Edmonton, uh, green onion cakes are very like mm. they're in a lot of Asian restaurants in general, <laughs> and it's it's kind of known as like the popular like Edmonton appetizer dish, um, you know, more so than other places I think in Canada. Like definitely not in Toronto, it wasn't like a staple almost. <laughs> And so here at Hot Pot, like all the Hot Pots I've seen, they, ha they you know, they have green onion cake. So I think that's definitely nice. like a really cool, um, yeah, thing that I look forward to every time I go to Hot Pot out here yeah. in Edmonton. I was uh, similar to Sean or to David. Growing up, uh, we didn't have a uh, Hot Pot, like, like what you can see in the restaurant nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember in cold winters, uh, my mom was a vegetables uh, vendor. So I grew up in the, oh. on the market, they like, very cold. So I always look at families, they, they purchase different kinds of vegetables, like fish and shrimp. And I just thought, oh, I wish I had the opportunity. I, you know, I wonder how it's like, you know, to have hot pot on the cold day. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and now it's so easy, right? You could go to any supermarket, you can get just so many varieties of meat and vegetables. And it made me feel like we are in a very good stage um, of the, you know, economy. You, you can access many de uh, delicious and um, nutritious food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and but Jen, it's interesting. And friend Ma's comment about hot pot was only winter food. This is one of the interesting things, Jen. Um, you also shared that in Taiwan, it's eaten, and, and I've seen this in Hong Kong. It's actually eaten in like the heat summer. of the summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As do you want to tell us about that, Jen? Oh no, I no. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm more curious. There's so many guests here. I, okay. I, I, I <laughs> um, what about you, Len? Um, I didn't grow up uh, eating hot pot. I um, we immigrated here uh, to Edmonton when I was a child, and we basically my 
we have a fairly large family and my, both my parents worked. Um, so the food that we usually eat is the um, standard um, Chinese uh, home, co uh, home cooking, but not really hot pot. Actually, I uh, got into cheese fondue before I even got into uh, <laughs> hot pot. So that tells you my wow <laughs> yeah i so i was i was I, I had a best friend growing up who's white and um every time i would talk about hot pot she would introduce like to her she would tell her white parents or friends like oh yeah that's the chinese fondue <laughs> and first, I, just, I was like one of those moments where you're like it's not racist but it's kind of weirdly racist like i just i was like it feels weird anyway just call story. it hot pot yeah just call it hot pot yeah it's hot pot yeah any other way yeah great um yeah i don't remember having hot pot growing up but it was definitely something i did, did as in community with friends as a young adult it's like kind of a favorite way to do hot like I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to pivot a little bit because I know that Aya Collective is, um, you know, has, uh, you're your artists um, and community uh, members. First of all, I love the name Aya Collective. Oh my God, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just brilliant. Um, so I want to know who first who came up with the name Aya Collective because it's just it's so good. David and I are constantly like ah yeah it's just like it's just <laughs> so endearing and it sounds amazing and it's just it's very close to our hearts um yeah so you know where how did you come up with the name mm -hmm. this is grace this is this was it's grace. Grace. Okay. it's the perfect thing to say when yeah. the chinatown gate is gone <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we, yeah, we jet like the long, I mean, I think we, we were kind of looking for a name and then Grace had, so like, I think this was the first thing you had suggested, Grace. Like, yeah. I think it was yeah. the first thing we had add, all heard and then we were just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. <laughs> so I, I think it was like, it just stuck, right? And I remember Grace also being like, how about like, are you guys sure like that you don't like <laughs> people have other ideas and we're like, no, no, this is no, it. No. Like, at least it was for me. I was just like, like perfect, right? Yeah. Because I, I, I think it represents so many different emotions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you just, yeah, you literally can just say it about anything and thinking about just what's going on with our Chinatown. I mean, you just, yeah, like what other way <laughs> Can you express, can you express that? <laughs> of how frustrating you know the you know some of the things are right and so it's just like ah yeah it's perfect <laughs> it's perfect it's, it's, it's perfect <laughs> I I am curious what your respective arts practice is um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do what you make mm -hmm. we could go back to a little bit about the China Gate yeah uh, that that we uh, have. Um, our friends got together and uh, I contacted a calligrapher to, to um, teach them how to use their bamboo brush to write uh, three Chinese words, Zhonghua Men. Zhonghua Men. And, and we had lots of fun and um, I proposed to use yarn and crochet uh, doilies attached to the, the writing Zhonghua Men and that's where people can write the memories about the gate mm -hmm. uh, on the same piece of paper. And the, the the reason I was thinking about the doily actually is from uh, I don't know more, uh, using yarn to make some uh, either tree bombing or the, the, some ornaments to mm. honor people, uh, members in the community. So they, they, I proposed to the our idea group and uh, I got the support from everybody. And I asked people to donate yarn. So we got really colorful collection of yarn. So and cool. then, it, yeah, we, we use that to honor the uh, the pioneers who came to Edmonton before us mm. because they have uh, overcome a lot of difficulties, you know, to mm -hmm. help the community to build, to be recognized, um, like the, 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 the way we see it today. Mm -hmm. um, there are many stories. Mm. Uh, I, I actually did a project called Oral History Project. 
that I interviewed 12 uh, seniors um, in the Chinese community. And some of the stories I heard, um, it, it just bring tears to me. How, 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 you know, the big challenges they have, like, you know, we, we cannot like, imagine, but they mm -hmm. did it. They did it with fine colors, you know, and, and then they, the nowadays we, we get all the recognition, you know, from so-called the mainstream society. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't there before, you yeah. know, with the generations and generations of people, they were willing to take the risk, you know, to help us to build what we have now. Yeah. And, and then uh, to me, like, you know, being Aya and then with the doilies we did, we, we hope to inspire people to continue to work together. Uh, like the feature of Aya is the intergenerationally um, mm -hmm. building knowledge. Yeah, yeah that's so that's so moving. Um, I even just think about like the sacrifices that my parents, you know, made and them giving up in so many ways parts of like very integral parts of who they are just so that I can be raised in this environment where I can be an individual, I can be a weirdo artist um, professionally, um, you know, like all of those things where I get to have so much um, identity as like that I get to choose, that I pick and choose versus my parents and, you know, not necessarily were given a choice. Um, so I think about the sacrifices um, a lot and the, and the, yeah, I think about that a lot actually <laughs> regarding my parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about other stories and how people received um, that work. But um, Jen, I was wondering, I actually, um, so yes. ne next week our guest is Karen Tam. Um, and I went, she has an exhibit at um, the Griffin Gallery in North Vancouver called Who's Chinatown right now. And I actually went to see it a couple weeks ago. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm talking to Aya Collective in a couple weeks. Um, so these are some of the images from um, what Wai Ling was sharing. Um, yeah, I'm curious if others have um, stories of of the project and and how it was received by by the public. Uh, I don't I don't know. I just remember it was like com I was compelled to make something visual to mark that mm. space that was empty. Like I felt this responsibility as someone who grew up in Edmonton, but also as an artist to remember visual landmarks, visual cultural landmarks. And I don't, I'm so happy that this, like this Wiling, Sean and Lan felt the same way and we still feel those things. But um, yeah, the stories, all we've collected over a hundred uh, uh, memories and it was, really beautiful to witness everyone's wishes and memories and thoughts. Um, but uh, I don't know, how, how do people receive it? I don't know, it's, it's more like, it's something we have, we just feel like we have to do despite what, what others think. Mm -hmm. That's actually kind of perfect because one of the questions that we, I think when Grace Sean and myself and David had our initial conversation about inviting all of you to do hot pot talks. Um, one of the, the topics that we wanted to talk about was what is an artist's ethical responsibility? What is our, our responsibility as artists in this context that we're in? Um, and where do we go from there? And so, I, yeah, I wonder if Sean and Grace, you can talk a little bit more about, yeah, how you feel, what you feel are your artists' responsibilities. Um, I, th I think with the work of Aya, we're, we're centered around the community and, and mm -hmm. what that means, at least for the project, is we see a relationship between like public space and, and how public space can change. And it basically, like with just the infrastructure of it, many of people's voices can get erased as well. And so I think there's like a symbolism that we're trying to show, but also like actually have a tangible relationship with to be, to realize what it meant for the community, right? Like to, mm -hmm. to open up that space, even though it's the structure's not there, it doesn't mean that it's like the, the, the life of it is over. And so I think, mm -hmm. I think one of the beautiful things um, that has made the work 
you know, really resonate for all of us is that is, is the relationship of building that community mm -hmm. and, and knowing what the community is inspired by, right? Or, or wants to dream about and, and think about. And so I think a huge part of like why we keep doing what we're doing is because we know there's so much energy around Chinatown and we know that people don't want to like see Chinatown go, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, what ways can we come together and, you know, imagine these futures together and like just kind of, you know, share different ideas. And so I think, I think this project has definitely like inspired us even more so to, to, to find other ways, right. To like get the community to work together and, and really surface some things that I think generally like, if we're just talking about we, you know, once once those people move on, it's like where are those stories now, right? And so, yeah, I, you know, I think, I think we're really just trying to have some sort of like way for the community to make their voice more public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. We want to. In a way, we're archiving stories that may be overlooked, like because we because of this project, we we um, raised um, Chinatown's voice, and at the same time, um, as artists, it's so important for us to create alternate ways of thinking, being alternate futures. So sometimes, yeah, it's it's a challenging to walk that line between honoring our elders and also being generative of possible futures, which I know that's something you, Jen and David, are doing too with your community. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that I'm always straddling that line um, of wanting to push those boundaries while not wanting to insult anyone or not honor um, mm -hmm. my past and my ancestors and the histories that I come with. Um, and so it's always this like uh, fine balance of like wanting to push the art and also wanting to be accessible. <laughs> so I don't have an answer to that, obviously. Uh, yeah. So I and, and it can be very paralyzing at times when I am creatively blocked, um, where I just like feel I can't do it. Um, but that's. Yeah. yeah, I just had a similar conversation today. I'm, I'm, I'm in school right now and I was talking to my supervisor about some of the pieces that I've been thinking about around art and activism and thinking about like the artist as the activist, as the community community facilitator. Um, yeah, and thinking and, 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 the, and the relative and the community member and sort of really sort of poking at how, where do we draw the line? Why are we drawing the line this way? How are the, these things actually very much the same thing? Like I think, you know, um, Wai Ling and Lan, you guys, we were talking about soup earlier and I've shared this a million times. So I'm not gonna share the story again, <laughs> but that, that, soup, that soup making is an art form. It's a, fun, it's a critical, and all of you have talked about how, how cr vital that, the, the food, the culture is to to yeah. us, right? Yet it is sort of those divisions of what is considered art, you know? Mm -hmm. People might not think of the, that soup making as, as art art making too. Um, so right. yeah, I, I love, love that, yeah. That's what's so wonderful about Paul Wong's work. Like you introduced yeah. his mother's cupboard and it's him as an artist using his platform as an artist, he's highlighting and raising um, the mother's labor and putting it in public space, which is really incredibly very powerful. Yeah, totally. And I, I, I missed this um, workshop that he did too, but I think it was during the launch and at the Sun Yat Sen Gardens, he actually had a suit making, people could come and I forget who, I think it was a relative of his actually that taught like how to make like a, a soup too. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, really cool. <laughs> I and again I I thought the the red lid thing was a thing that only a weird thing that my family's saving like the what is it the Max coffee I thought it was a weird thing that my parents did because they because <laughs> they were frugal and then I learned every every Chinese household has them it's so hilarious yeah I like to comment on the tote bag design you have yeah have, have eaten um 
it's such an important phase. I explained to my husband, who is the Irish Canadian, they, we, we, we greet people not just like ni hao, right? Yes. We usually, they, you know, oh, sit a family, yeah. So yeah. I explained to him, it's not just like whether you have eaten, it's like my care. I, yeah. I, you know, I want to know how you're doing. You know, mm. not just whether you have food in your tummy, but maybe your overall uh, well-being. You know, and it's such a easy to say face, and it's like so simple. But the, the love, you know, in the Chinese community, we have this, like, you know, as a greeting. Yeah. And it's so beautiful, mm. right? And it's, it's, I, mean, I, like, I like the choice of the, you know, the question there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I will buy one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess one of the things you can say is you never go hungry when you're in Chinatown. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> I'm curious, we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our time, but I'm curious, what are your, going back to where actually we started, you know, what the, this idea of dreaming new futures, um, what are you guys up to? What do you guys have visions for? What are your big dreams for, for yourselves or for IA Collective? I think, wow. um, and, and this is totally generated from the, the amazing conversation right now. Um, I, I want to be able to tap into some of the things that like I know to be like my truth that I am like scared to like ask my parents or ask myself or show within like a public space, right? Like I, I, and I hope that when I do that, that people that see that realize that they're not isolated in that type of thinking as well. So, you know, I think, I think growing up as like, you know, a minority in Canada, like you have every reason to like beat yourself down to tell people, like tell yourself that your story isn't valuable. Right. And so, you know, a huge part of like loving to work with the people that I'm with is just being able to love myself, you know? So, (laughs) well you guys helped me generate it so i I I was there it's all because of you as well so thank you so much that was so good that was was so so good good. i I think i think one thing we like to see is continue building uh building allies like with you guys love in intercession you know Mm. it's only by uh connecting building uh, and then we continue inspiring each other to do the work, right? Hmm. Uh, whereas I, uh, the way I grew up, my mom always said, "Don't say too much. Don't be troublemaker." Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm do- I'm doing the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Even though at, at, at my age, I'm still doing the opposite because yeah. I think it's important, you know, to to stir up a little trouble, you know, to yes. get awareness, get the support, you know, for more and more people. I think traditionally Chinese people has been too quiet, you know, for too many generations. Yeah. And now we have generations like you guys, you have the language to communicate and you need some support. And, and that's how I feel my, my role will be here. Wow. To support you guys. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Grace and Lan, any? Um, last word. May, maybe I'll leave the last word to Grace. Um, what I'm actually I'm really excited because um, uh, I've been to know that there's so many um, there are a rising number of uh, young people who are very interested in um, researching um, Edmonton's Chinatown. So that is very um, heartwarming for me because uh, doing Chinatown work sometimes can be quite lonely and you you feel like you're the only person who really care uh, about um, Chinatown. But it's really heartwarming to know there um, there's uh, people who are very interested and they want to do more. They don't want to be on the sideline. They actually, want to research, do research about the history or do things that would um, 
amplify uh, Chinatown. So I, I'm delighted to to see that. The only the other thing you asked, what is it that I like? Uh, I want to do. Um, what I'm doing now is looking at creating space where we can tell space where uh, creating space where we have been absent. Uh, I was talking to uh, somebody this morning um, and because she's very interested in researching about Chinatown. And one thing I said to her is that um, what, one of my goals actually is to be able to take a generic history about uh, this, uh, Edmonton and make sure that the, the Chinese stories are not forgotten in those pages. Um, and so to look at ways where we could um, tell out, make sure that look for those uh, spaces, look for places where we can tell our story and make sure that uh, that it's there because off to, and I think that goes back to Weiling's point, off to often, all too often we, we've forgotten or else it's very skimpy uh, about who we are mm -hmm. and about our contribution to, um, to our city or even to Canada in general. So that's what I'm looking at exploring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lan. Yeah. Yeah, I, I loved everyone's answers. And I think what particularly really resonated with what Sean said about spaces of belonging and, and ideas of family. And Aya isn't the only like opening for that. I, there's so many more expressions of what Chinatown is. So I would love to see, I would love to see that in Edmonton, um, different groups um, just expressing the beautiful things about Chinatown and um, all supporting each other in solidarity because it's such a important, it's so important to have public spaces that um, are diverse and expressive and represent the people who live here. Cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. This was such an amazing conversation. Um, Jen, um, we're gonna, should we say goodbye to our guests and then um, announce our next week's guest? I, I guess we have to. I don't want to because I'm enjoying this conversation <laughs> way too much. Um, and, um, but I suppose the time has come. Um, okay. But I am looking forward to um, future conversations with Aya Collective. Um, I'm just, I'm really moved. I think I, I've enjoyed all of the hot pot talks, but this one in particular has just like really moved something in me. And so um, I just want to thank um, Wylan. Sorry, I'm losing it. I'm actually tearing up because it's just, I, I don't have these conversations very, very often. And um, yeah, D sorry, David, can you? Um, yeah, no, yeah. thank you so much. Well, it really, I think it really touches on 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 family right and and our yeah. and and our identities right it really really gets in there so thank you so mm -hmm. much thank you so much Wai Ling, Lan, Sean and Grace this was an amazing conversation thank you David and Jess thank you so much yeah thank you yeah. Oh my God! Oh. <laughs> I did not expect this. What the hell? Uh, well, let's, okay. that's hot pot talks. You never what? know. <laughs> I did not anticipate that. Okay, so our next guest is uh, Karen Tam. Um, did, did you want to say yeah, something I, about Karen? I, uh, yeah, uh, Karen Tam, as we mentioned before, was uh, one, was an artist who, who has uh, put together an exhibit at the Griffin Gallery called Who's Chinatown? Um, and just a reminder, we have, yeah, there's the exhibit. We have Hot Pot Talks uh, bags available for sale. Um, have you eaten today? I will show it to the camera, perhaps. I also just wanted to, sh to show, I'm very proud of this very beautiful Napa. One second. <laughs> We love Napa so much. We do. 
that's our favorite. Um, it's this beautiful, beautiful, oh, perfectly shaped Napa cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know, we had a photo shoot where we were like almost covered in Napa cabbage last year. Yes. Um, anyways, so we have hot pot talks uh, bags available. We also have hot Chinatown hot pot packs. Um, each of the guests have um, shared with us their favorite hot pot ingredient, um, and we're going to be um, we're we're selling them um, in support of our engaging Chinatown um, uh, project. Um, all of the ingredients are going to be sourced from uh, Vancouver's Chinatown. Um, yeah, and with a with an ingredient uh, uh, that was the favorite of each of each each guest or each guest group. So yeah. The link is in the bio to purchase. Thanks, everyone. And we will see you next week for, um, with Karen Tam at uh, Hot Hot Talks. Bye. Have, have a good night. <laughs>